All right, let's bow our hearts and our uh, heads together. Father God, I just thank you, Father, for your word. The Bible says the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, the word is God, and I thank you, Father, that it imparts the seed of the Messiah in us, Father. Uh, we are made from dirt, and the only good thing for dirt is to receive the seed, Lord. So open our eyes to see in your living word, Father, the revelation that brings the, our understanding of the Messiah and who he is to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, anyway, I'm going to start with a scripture right up top. Number one. This is, uh, what is the significance of the hem of Jesus' garment, okay? Now, uh, we're going to see that there are several scriptures that say people just came from every which way. Uh, to all, they just wanted to touch the hem of his garment. And every single one who touched that hem was healed, okay? Now, that's kind of strange. Uh, clothing has power or something to, to uh, impart healing. But uh, it has a background, okay? Scripture number one, says Deuteronomy 22, 12, says you shall make tassels. The Hebrew is tzitzit. Everybody say that. Tzitzit. Yeah, kind of sound like a bird or something. But it, it means a tassel or a tuft, uh, a, 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 like a lock of hair, something that's kind of hanging off the edge of a garment, okay? And it says uh, this is a command of God that you should make these uh, tassels, tzitzit, and put them on the four corners of the garments you wear. Okay. Now, uh, the, the types of garments and the way people dressed over the years has, has evolved and changed, you know, but uh, 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 the, some, some now garments sometimes don't have corners down there, you know, they're kind of rounded off or whatever, you know, but so the, the, the way it was done was kind of evolved over the years. But so, but it says, <clears throat> next verse says, Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels, seat seat, on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread, techlet, techlet, okay, in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel uh, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them. Okay. Now, so here we got these little tassels. There's a bunch of them around here. That, that is the tassel. It's called a tzitzit. Okay, and it has uh, uh, four strands doubled back on itself, so a total of eight strands. There's a particular pattern of the knots in there. You probably remember that Hebrew letters, uh, just as like Greek and Latin, uh, you know, numbers are letters, okay? The letters, the various letters in the alphabet of those ancient languages, uh, each of them has a numeric value, okay? Well, the knots on there uh, can be interpreted, therefore, uh, based on the number of knots and location, all that kind of stuff, it actually has a meaning, okay? And if you, uh, the, the, it turns out if you take the Torah, which is the, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the, the Hebrews call their Bible the Tanakh, the Tanakh. That's the whole Old Testament divided up into three sections, the Torah, Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. That's the law and the prophets and the writings, okay? But so the Torah is, that's, that's those commandments that God gave, uh, you know, to, for his people to obey, okay? So it turns out that if you take all of the commandments of the Torah and take them individually, the do's and the don'ts and all that, and you count them up, it's 613, total 613. So these knots actually uh, add up or represent that 613 commands of, commandments of God. Now, uh, and the blue thread has a very interesting history. This down here, you can see the blue threads in in the seat seat. Uh, here and there, there's um, a molex, uh, you know, a, a shell. See those? Uh, it turns out that that's this. This is royal blue or royal purple. Okay. Remember Lydia, the purveyor of purple fabrics, okay? Uh, she, uh, you know, uh, sold uh, clothing or cloth or something like that with this uh, uh, 
uh, it's uh, Tyrrhenian uh, purple, okay? And uh, it took, see these little uh, molluscs or these little uh, snails or I don't know, whatever you call them. Uh, it, it, it takes 8,000 of those to make one gram of dye. It takes 3.8 million of those things to make one pound of royal purple. So you can imagine it was only the wealthy or the royalty uh, that were allowed to wear that. I mean, they did, nobody could afford it. But, you know, God uh, showed the Israelites how to do that. and they, they didn't have to have the whole thing blue, but just one strand in there because we are kings and priests unto God, okay? So it represents the royalty um, of us, you know, as servants of the living God, all right? So the way this uh, tallit was put on, and it, it means little tent, tent, okay? Now, uh, there's a picture in your set of pictures there showing a camp, a campsite, uh, and in, with the 12 tribes of Israel grouped around uh, the camp, okay? In the middle of the camp is a, what's called the Mishkan, which is the tabernacle in the wilderness, the tabernacle. You know, God said, well, we're, we're not going unless your presence comes with us. And so God had promised him that I'll, I will be there, I'll be present, okay? And on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the instructions of how to build a tabernacle of his presence. Remember that? Okay. And so then he imparted some special skills to some people to do that. And remember on the way out of Egypt, uh, God had put it on the hearts of the Egyptians to give them all their gold and silver and brass and all these kind of things. And so when in the wilderness where, you know, not much around and no hardware stores, okay, but then God gave him the directions of how to, how to build this tabernacle, okay? Tabernacle simply means a house, okay? It's a dwelling place, all right? And so uh, we've talked some about this where the tabernacle has three parts to it. It has a court, it has a holy place, and a holy of holies, okay? And that represents the triune nature of a person, okay? You are spirit, soul, and body, okay? The holy of holies, is where the presence of God abides, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. And it was over the Ark of the Covenant where the Shekinah glory, uh, remember the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day, uh, and that was the presence of God there, okay? So, and then the holy place was where the uh, menorah and the altar of incense and the table of showbread was, okay? And then outside of there was the brazen lava and the brazen altar. And then the eastern gate, uh, there's only one gate. Remember, Jesus said, I, you know, I'm the gate to the sheepfold. All right. And so, but these represents the way and the truth and the life in a believer. Okay. Uh, and basically the tabernacle is simply a representation of how a sinful man can approach a holy God. And each piece of furniture represents uh, uh, an essential part of, of, uh, of how we can prepare our way into the holy place and holy of holies. Okay. Now, every day, every day, uh, there was what's called a morning and evening sacrifice. All right. So uh, the morning sacrifice was put up on, uh, was at 9 a.m. and the afternoon was 3 p.m. Now, what, when was Jesus put on the cross? Uh, at 9 a.m., put on, taken down, 3 p.m., uh, and so he represents that morning and evening sacrifice, okay? Now, of course, that little tabernacle down there with whatever it is, uh, millions of people uh, in the various tribes uh, scattered around the, uh, uh, this encampment, Okay, you notice all the tents organized according to tribe, okay? If you go to the book of, the num of Numbers, there's a whole lot, I mean, numbers and numbers and numbers, you wonder what in the world. But uh, if you take the trouble to actually, you know, place each tribe, like for example, just outside the entrance is the tribe of Judah, you know? And if you, ma you make the size of all the little people and 
collection of people and that kind of stuff according to those numbers in the in the book uh, what you get uh, did you see the picture forms a cross there it is uh, how about that you know so every every day at the morning and evening sacrifice see this whole camp is is just a representation uh, of the gift of life through Christ okay he is the way man he, he's the way to the father okay but um, so uh, at each of these times, obviously, not everybody can go down there with the Levites and go into the tabernacle. I mean, you never get them all in there. So every male would have one of these, a tallit. What does what tallit mean? Little tent, okay? So the tabernacle, that's the big tent, you know. So as the morning and evening sacrifice was done, uh, that all the men would stand out side of their little tents down there. So while the Levites and the priests were uh, doing the sacrifice in the big tent, each individual would don his tallit and enter into the secret place of the Most High in the little tent, okay? And, and that's, that's what this represents. This represents the shadow of the Almighty, okay? And, and the as they put that on, each of them would first, first thing you do, you grab those seat seat, okay? You gather them together, all right? And what does it represent? The law, the word of God, okay? And the whole purpose, God said that seat seat has the reason it's there is for this reason. So that when you look on it, you'll remember to obey my commands. Okay, so here's the way they did it. They, they would gather those seat seat from each of the four corners and they were told to wrap the strands around their hands and then look at it, you know, and vow never to forget God's commands. Now there's a tradition that came out of that to tie a string around your fingers so you don't forget something. Okay, you ever hear that? Well, guess where that comes from? Right here. Here it is. Okay. And, and so this dye that is royalty, this, you know, takes thousands or tens of thousands of these little uh, snails to produce this kind of, uh, the amount of dye necessary to put these all together. But it represents that we are kings and priests unto God, all right? And, and, and the, that tzitzit represents the power of the Word of God. The Word of God is what? Alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide asunder soul and spirit, etc. You know, um, but so it, this was in a sense a, a, a play, a, a parable, you know. They see the, that strip of color up on top is called the atara, which means the crown, okay? Now, of course, our reward after living a life holy with God and that kind of stuff is there's actually five different crowns that are promised in Scripture, you know, a uh, crown of righteousness and on and on, you know. But this, written in Hebrew there, is, is a statement that you make a vow, you know, and it says, Blessed art thou, Lord of God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by his commandments and commands us to wear uh, the tzitzit, okay? So each time they get ready to uh, go into the secret place the Most High. They make that bow, they, they grab the seat seat, and they promise never to forget God's commandments, and then they spend their little time in here. Now, there's some pictures in there of uh, where sometimes people will take the, the tallit and just kind of wrap it around their heads, okay? Uh, it, there's a story where it described Elijah when he was up there hearing the voice of the Lord, you know. Uh, there was an earthquake, there was a fire, there was all these huge things happening. But the still, small voice of the Lord. God spoke to Moses, or to Elijah, and it was while the Bible says he had his mantle wrapped around his head, and then God spoke to him, okay? So what happens is, is, this is where we hear, you know, the word of the Lord, okay? Well, we get it in by ourselves, in the secret place, under the shadow of the Almighty, you know, close the door and, and pray to our Father in heaven, okay, in secret. And this is where we learn to commune, you see, 
you know, with the Father. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so um, so this was ever all, all Jewish men had these. They they were uh, you know generally women didn't wear them, but more and more you know women are are using them. Uh, I know we get some videos sometimes about with Celeste. Remember Celeste? You know, and that's she's always in a tallit. You know, <laughs> so. But uh, uh, more and more, uh, uh, I'll say, uh, Protestants, uh, you know, people are getting into their Jewish roots or their Hebrew roots, I'll call it that way, uh, and finding out the beauty. I just, I mean, my gosh, there's so many revelations in Scripture that just kind of teach us more and more um, uh, about walking in the light. You know, the, the entire life of a Christian begins with revelation, maintained by revelation. I mean, it's... You can't get it any other way, you know. So, all right. Well, that's uh, that's kind of a uh, 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 an introduction of that. Then, if we go to Matthew chapter uh, nine, there you'll notice that it says there was um, a woman who had this is verse twenty had a flow of blood for twelve years that she uh, came from behind and touched the hem. Now, the edge of this. Uh, talit is called the hem or the border, okay, or the wing, all right, and the seat seat that's hanging off of it, uh, of course, that represents the word of God, okay. Now, in if you go up to uh, verse three, or not verse three, but I'm uh, 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 scripture three, Malachi four two. Do you see that? All right, it says, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And the word, the word there, that's the same one that's talking about the wings under the shadow of the Most High, you know. Uh, it represents that part of the tallit. When you put it on, that part that hangs down over your arms is called the wings, okay. And uh, so God... It, you know, we're the bride. We're supposed to be to be married. You know, to to God, or to I should say, to uh, you know, to Messiah. All right, and and it's the Father that uh, you know when a husband and wife get married, uh, and you know the way you do that is uh, is simply with words. You know, do you? Uh, to, to the woman here, do you take this man to be your lawful wedded husband, to love and to cherish and to uh, have do the vacuuming or whatever, you know, uh, till death do you part, okay? And, and uh, so both the man and the woman, the, the minister, the person, the representative of God, okay, will uh, have each person make a declaration, a vow, okay, uh, that yes, I do take this person to be my lawful wedded husband or wife, you know, and then then what happens? The, the pastor or minister of the gospel, the representative of God, says, now by the power invested in me, or, the, you know, I now pronounce you husband and wife, okay? Now, uh, it, you know, you got married just by saying I do, okay? And and it's this is a covenant, a blood covenant, uh, I think, you know, I think I've probably mentioned the blood covenant is based on a blood sacrifice of something, you know. And it turns out that a human being, a woman, is the only mammalian species that has this thing called a hymen. You know, and so when a marriage is consummated, there's a shedding of blood, okay. And in ancient times in the Hebrew culture, uh, when a husband and wife uh, you got married and on the wedding night, uh, it kind of, might sound kind of strange, but the, the, the mother of the bride would always save the sheets, you know, <laughs> as proof that the, da the daughter was a virgin or whatever, you know. Uh, and, uh, but it was a consummation. Does that make sense? Okay. And, and uh, Samuel, or not, not Samuel, but Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes talks about how God the Father represents the strand that ties together a husband and wife in that covenant, okay? And so there's the strand right there. That's, that's it, okay? So when a husband puts his wings over a woman and they get married, now when, when they get married, here's, here's the way a Jewish marriage works. 
the husband, of course, makes his proposal by putting the, the wing over this woman. And it, it's just like saying, hey, let's get married, you know. And we see Ruth did that uh, at the edge of the threshing floor. She says uh, to Boaz, you know, uh, place your skirt over me, your wing, your, uh, you know, uh, over me. In other words, she was saying, let's get married, okay. And, and, but then when a husband and wife do get married, guess what, how they do that? They take a big one of these, great big one, called a chupa. Chupa, and they put it up on four posts, and so there's a great big old talit, okay, uh, standing on these big four legs, and the husband and the wife and the representative of God, then uh, they make their vows and everything under the chupa, knowing that this is under the wings of the Almighty God, okay? And, and the, this represents a place of protection, that God ratifies this marriage covenant and promises in his word to love and to hold and to cherish, you know, just like it represents, you know, the same thing God asks of us, okay? And, and when we look at the tallit and, and grab those seat seat, these promises of God represent, you know, God's promise to us to love, to hold, to cherish, Ever, never, never, okay? And it's a, an entrance, it's a, it's a covenant of love, okay? But, in, you know, the way it's ratified is with a substitute sacrifice because, okay, turns out you cannot get married if you're unclean. All right, so here's this woman who has this female-type hemorrhage, and according to the law in Leviticus, all right, Someone who has any discharge like that of blood, she's considered unclean, okay? Now, normally that's just temporary, okay? Uh, and so, you know, once it resolves, okay? But still, she's considered unclean for seven days, all right? And, and uh, must do bathing in what's called a mikvah, mikvah, okay? Which is kind of like a water baptism, all right? And, and this, uh, and again, everything has a spiritual meaning, okay? Now, let, let me just say, uh, infidelity between God and his people was very bothersome to God, you know, uh, that they would serve other gods, all right? Now, think about this for a second. What, what is an adulteress? What is an adulteress? It's a woman who receives seed, from someone other than her husband. So when God's people, okay, his seed is the word of God, the living seed, the pure and perfect seed. But if we go out and chase after other gods, they sow seeds also. The devil went into the Garden of Eden with nothing more than words, and he caused the fall of all mankind. So an adulteress is any of us, if we receive seed from someone other than our betrothed, you see, were considered unclean. Now, so many of these concepts are types and shadows, parables, uh, that the little jots and tittles in the law that seem not to make any sense sometimes to the natural mind, okay? But it's only when the Holy Spirit will kind of turn the light on and we begin to understand uh, the the true spiritual meaning. It's always the spiritual meaning that, that becomes something living and sown and planted in our hearts that will then change us. The flesh profits nothing, nothing. You know, so, you know, if I, I mean, I can get an academic degree in the word and uh, learn all kinds of things, go to several seminaries, uh, but unless I have the spirit of God, doesn't mean a darn thing because I can't see, you know, it requires, the Holy Spirit must be present, you know, to show the truth, all right? Does that make sense? The spirit of truth, okay, now. Um, but anyway, so uh, this, we in this life down here, uh, we are living out, we're li all of us are living epistles, known and read by men, okay? Um, you understand that, that principle? You know, everybody's life, 
in the relationship with God as our creator, you know, the, the life that we live represents our relationship with him, okay? Either as we live our life for him or against him, okay, or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Abram is a great example. Let's try Hosea first. Remember, Hosea was a prophet of God. Hoshea means savior, okay, or salvation. He was a prophet of God. One day, you know, God said, uh, Hosea, I, I picked out a bride for you, man. You know, and he's probably all excited. And, uh, and uh, he said, and God says, I want you to run over to Avenue D, you know, and... And uh, there's a woman over there, okay? Gomer is her name. And, uh, but she's unfaithful, okay? She is unfaithful, and she is going to break your heart, you know? But you see, God was having Hosea actually live out and experience in person the way God felt when he was treated so terribly by his betrothed. Does that make sense? So, um, you know, and God kept saying, you know, if you don't stop serving these other gods, okay, uh, then, you know, warning after warning after warning, you know, and finally said, well, I'm going to send the Syrians in there and they're going to scatter you over the earth. And, and uh, your, uh, what's the name of that first son? No, uh, Hosea's son, that means to scatter seed. Je yeah, it is. No, it's Jezreel. You're right. Yeah, Jezreel was the first son of that relationship. And it means to scatter like seed. Okay. Now, remember, the sons of Jacob were promised to Abraham as sand seed and star seed. Okay. And seed is, has to be sown out into the ground. You know, but it, God told Hosea, Hosea, uh, because of Gomer's unfaithfulness, that he was going to take the people of northern, the northern kingdom of Israel and he's going to send in an army, the Syrians, and they were going to conquer them and scatter them over the whole earth just like seed. Okay, so, and he lived out that little parable, okay, and, and that's his life was a living epistle, okay. Now, Abram is another example. Okay, Abram, the name Abram means exalted father. Okay, and, and you know, God promised a seed through which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Remember Abram and Sarai, and they were elderly, and uh, uh, Sarai pretty soon had menopause, and she was no longer in a womanly way, or however you might say that, you know, that we're no longer having cycles. And uh, so when you're in that situation, you can't bear seed, you know. Uh, and, and so in a natural realm, according to Revelation, or according to uh, Romans 4, it was impossible for her to get pregnant. Now, they had already tried. We need to help out God, you know. So you probably remember the story about um, Sarai just didn't seem like anything was happening. So she told Abram to go into the, uh, you know, Egyptian handmaid, Hagar, and uh, let's have a kid. You know, then, then he'll be the heir. Okay, remember that? Okay, well, what was that child's name? Ishmael. Ishmael. So Ishmael was actually the firstborn of Abram, but not of Sarah. Okay, but God has, had promised that it was through he and Sarah that the redeeming seed would come. Okay. Now, this is what happens when we try to help God. All right? And, and, and we usually enter the kingdom of God. Oh, man, all the things I'm going to do for God, you know. And unfortunately, we sometimes grab the ball and try to do things, but the flesh profiteth nothing. Of thyself, you can't do nothing, Okay. And, and this is where at judgment, you know, when the fires of judgment come in the end times, you know, there's wood, hay, and stubble, and there's gold, silver, and precious stones. So what's the wood, hay, and stubble? That's all the stuff you cooked up, you know, 
and got down on your knees and prayed, Lord, bless my plans. Well, that's not the way we're, this is supposed to work. It's supposed to be, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when, when God can work through us, us get out of the way, then the reward for that is simple for obedience. And that's gold, silver, and precious stones. Lasts eternally, okay? And so, but anyway, Abram uh, has Ishmael, and he said, God, let Ishmael be mine heir. And God said, nope, one from your own loins through Sarah is going to be thine heir, okay? And of course, Isaac finally got there, all right? But so, remember, this is a parable. Yeah. That's that's right. That's right. You know what I mean? It, it, it just right. seems like God, like women were just. Well, here's. You know, it just seems like he was yeah. always the, just. Well, no, I will say the Hebrew um, God treats females far, far better than virtually any other people. Okay. And, and sometimes it may not seem that way, okay? But, for example, how did sin enter the human race? Through a woman. Where does redemption come from the human race? Through a woman. A virgin birth, okay? God will always turn things around. But, I mean, you're but, just saying they didn't inherit land. They couldn't inherit anything. They couldn't, yeah. you know, they were just sort of second class all the time. Well, yes. So, so we actually talk about this in our teenage uh, group because this is yeah. uh, something that comes up, I guess, in the culture on why mm -hmm. people don't, you know, go with Christianity. Um, that uh, I guess, like Jesus was some kind of. Narcissist. Okay, go ahead, and quick, quick. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but um, you know, he used women yeah. so mightily in the beginning, from even. Um, the starting with the um, help me, Father, Deborah, the judges, the, well, you know. even even with the uh, doulas and things like that, they were using yeah. to kill male babies in Egypt. Oh yeah, right. And they did not listen to Pharaoh, right? And they feared God. And yes. So he used those female midwives. Midwives, yeah, yeah. From there yeah. to uh, Moses' mother, who yeah. kept him for three months and hid him to. The, right. Even yeah. the Pharaoh's daughter to the servant of Pharaoh's daughter to oh, okay. all these were women. Yeah. Now I'm gonna, I'm going to go ahead and go on just just because we're recording. Okay. So, um, but the the point being that um, uh, you know God is no respecter of persons. Okay. All male, female. The Bible says in Christ there is neither male nor female, mm -hmm. neither Jew nor Greek. Everybody, what he does for one, he will do for all. It only takes faith and trust. Trust and obey. There's no other way. Okay? But God, uh, every single person, if we just have a willing heart, okay, I mean, God can move mountains. Um, you know, if we just trust in Him, look in the Word, believe what He says, you know, that nothing shall be impossible to you. All right? Now, so, um, but... So Abram, his life was a parable in that sense, okay? Uh, it was all about God. Now the Bible, Jesus said one day later on, he says, Abraham saw my day and was glad. Because he spoke of Abram like he was his friend, and yet Abram was called the friend of God. You know, and so the Jewish people said, you know, you don't know Abraham, you're not yet 50 years old. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. That's the everlasting one, okay? And, and see, uh, uh, and of course the Jews picked up rocks and they were going to stone him and all that kind of stuff, you know? But Ishmael is a type of the first Adam. He's a type of the first Adam. He's a work of the flesh, okay? The flesh profiteth nothing, okay? And, and, just as, and so everything has a meaning. The first Adam was corrupted with sin, the last Adam, you know, is a life-giving spirit, okay? And we all are birthed as the first Adam in his nature and likeness. That's that death of the firstborn. Remember that talked about that, that tenth plague back in Egypt, okay? You know, I mean, uh, Jesus said, 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And the law will never pass away, but every jot and every tittle will be fulfilled. And, and, I, and so many people wrongly think, well, we're under the new covenant, okay? And so it doesn't, you know, the old covenant doesn't apply to me anymore, okay? What was the purpose of the old covenant? To kill the flesh. The latter killeth, but the spirit gives life. Until you've gotten to the place where by the Spirit you've put to death every last bit of the Spirit, or of the flesh, okay, then you're still under the law. Jesus, you know, God said in the Garden of Eden, He said that this serpent, okay, buddy, you know, He says to the serpent, all the days of your life you're going to crawl around and eat of the dust. Well, what's the dust? That's the flesh. That's what man was made from. And so, but the goal is to take up our cross daily and die to self. So we can come to the place where, like Paul, we can say, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And this life I now live in this still flesh, I live in, you know, I live by faith in the Son of God. You remember we've talked about how Jesus, everybody thinks, well, he was born perfect. You know, it's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he was perfected through suffering. Why did he have to suffer? Because he was through Mary. He had some of that Adamic nature. Okay? And so the, and the devil was allowed. He was tempted in every which way as we are, and yet without sin. He had to go through that because he was not the spotless lamb that could take away our sins until he was tested. Does that make sense? And every time, by the power of the Spirit of God in him, he said no to every temptation. Every time that happened, his flesh got more and more crucified till there was nothing left. That's why he said, Satan came to me and he found nothing in me. And see, we, we, that's the goal. That's the goal, you know. If you, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh, then you will live. You're going to find that abundance of life that you didn't even imagine could exist. Does that make sense? We all are a work in progress. Okay? Now, the strange thing about the promises of God, all of the promises are already legally ours. The Bible says in Hebrews that you have been sanctified forever by one sacrifice. It's past tense. But until by faith I reach out and take what's legally mine, that it becomes manifest in me, I don't have it. I mean, I have it. You see what I'm saying, though? And, and it's just a, faith is a strange thing. All right? We talked about how when we play chess or something like that, you know, Normally, one guy moves, now it's your turn, then it's your turn, and, you know, you go back and forth. I'm going to tell you something. So much of the time down here, we, we're waiting for God to do something. Would you just make a move, God? Well, but the Bible basically tells us he's made every single move necessary for all eternity. It's already over. When he died, he, just before he did, it says, it is finished. In fact, it said that he was crucified before the foundation of the world. The penalty for sin has been paid. I already have legally everything. All things that pertain to life and godliness have already been given. They're all mine, okay? But I have to believe it to receive it. Act on it, you know. Play like it's real, you know. You know what I'm saying? And, and as, as we do that, walk in faith, not by sight, okay? then God can fulfill his word because he watches over his word to fulfill it. Okay, now I kind of got off on the sidetrack there, but uh, man, good stuff. All right, so anyway, this woman with a hemorrhage of 12 years here, she is unclean. Can I imagine this? According to Leviticus, she's considered unclean. She cannot be around anybody. Every single thing she touches from the doorknob sit on a bed, her husband can't touch her, you know, can't have a physical relationship, nobody can be close to her, around her. You ever notice that when they had feasts in Israel, uh, Jesus one time said, he said, the Pharisees, you're like whitewashed tombs. 
You're all pretty and nice on the outside, but inside you're just full of dead men's bones. What's he talking about? Okay, because a tomb has a dead person in it. And anything dead will uh, corrupt you. You can't, you can't touch anything, such as this woman who's, you know, unclean, or a dead body, or anything like that. So when the feasts were coming, and there were, mil- you know, hundreds of thousands of people, or I'm sorry, just say thousands, would come up for the feasts, you know, you didn't, wouldn't want to, oops, accidentally lean on a tombstone, right? Oh my God, now, because now you're unclean, and you cannot take the feast until you get seven days of mikvah and cleansing and all that kind of thing, okay? So to make sure that there's no mistake, they whitewash all the tombs, anything that's unclean, you know. So it looks nice. You understand what I'm saying? But this woman now was unclean. She couldn't have any relationship whatsoever. She was an outcast from society. If anybody knew she was out there walking around, you know, they'd, they'd start throwing rocks and all this kind of stuff, you know, yelling at her, whatever, just like to a leper, all right? But the Bible says she heard about Jesus. And she remembers this scripture in Malachi that said, when the Son of Righteousness comes, he will come with healing in his wings. So she said to herself, if I but touch the hem of his garden, come up and grab that seat seat, I'll be made whole. All right? And so she declared it. She decreed it. She started to act on it. So against it, all laws and regulations or whatever, she's shoving her away. She's, I'm going to find Jesus. You know, and the Bible says there was pandemonium around him. You know, people pushing and shoving and whatever, but she came up behind him and reached out and grabbed that seat seat. And, and suddenly, boom, power flows. She knows it. She knows, okay? And Jesus turns around and he said, who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples said, what are you talking about, man? Everybody's shoving and pushing around you. I mean, I I can't even count the number of people that are pushing on you. Now, somebody touched me with faith. You know, there's some power over here in these plugs. It's always there. But do you know what? Faith is the plug. And nothing happens with that power until I plug in my faith. But she did that. Notice, she heard, she believed, she declared, she acted, and received. And then confessed, fall down in front of Jesus and say, oh, you know, tell him the whole story. Now here's what's interesting. Remember, everything she touched becomes unclean. Well, she just touched Jesus. Uh Oh, but see, the blood cleansed her. All right, he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go and be free of your infirmity. And she went out and told everybody, you know. But see, that's, that is, receiving from God is just this. You hear it. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You believe it. You act on it. You declare it. You decree it. Job says, decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and light shall shine upon thy ways. Okay? So she declared it. She acted on it. Okay? She did it. All right? And as she went, it's like those lepers, that as they went, they were healed. Okay? Action produces, is a, is a result of faith. Okay? And so what's interesting is, so bang, when she did what she said, she decreed in advance, if I just touch that seat seat, I know. You know, the Word of God says that when the Son of Righteousness comes, He's going to come with healing in His wings. And she reached out, touched, got healed, you know, end of the story. Well, no, that was just the beginning, <laughs> you know. Uh, she went out and told a whole lot of people, I'm sure. So, but, now, you know, there's two ways to receive healing. One is by the promise of God. And that's what she just got. The other is by a miraculous gift of the Spirit. Okay, and one of the gifts of the Spirit 
okay, of the nine gifts promised, okay. Jesus one time said, you know, he's talking about the Jacob's well that wells up to eternal life. You know, the woman at the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, if you were to ask me, I'd give you living water. And you'd never be thirsty again. They were at Jacob's well. Well, what's Jacob's well? That is Jesus. That's him. She did, you know, he's standing there on, by Jacob's well, and it's him, <laughs> you know. Jacob's well, it's a parable, but he's the real Jacob's well, okay? Now, but he also promises this living water. He said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Thus spake he of the Spirit, which all those who believed in him were to receive, okay? And, and what's that talking about? The well of water, that's inside of you because he lives in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he's down there. It's like when he's sleeping at the, you know, behind, at the stern in the boat. He's always there. But sometimes you've got to wake him up, you know. If you're going through a storm, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, he, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But sometimes we've got to wake him up. And the same thing is true with this well of water down inside of us. Sometimes you've got to draw down to these waters of life. You know, spend some time in your secret place under the shadow and the power of the Almighty God, you know, and he'll slake your thirst, you know. Bring the presence of God, the power, uh, to provide anything we need. Now, so what's the difference between a well of water and rivers of living water? The well of water is for you. That's us, okay? The rivers of living water are for others. Others. Because him, he is in you. And, you, you know, the Bible says we have a ministry of reconciliation. All right? God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And, and it, Jesus wants us to go out and, you know, tell everybody else. Uh, and that's when he acts on uh, the words that we speak to others, all right, that bring faith, bring promises as we pray, lay hands, you know, whatever, you know, he watches over his word to perform it and, and uh, will fulfill the, you know, all the promises of God that are yes and amen in Christ. Make, make sense? Okay. All right. So, um, but anyway, so th this woman... Uh, she just touched the hem of his garment. Now, a little bit later, dish. remember this, this guy, Jairus, okay, what was he? He was a, a head of the synagogue, all right? And that's where, in the midst of this story, Jesus originally was going to Jairus' house because Jairus said, please come to my house because my 12-year-old daughter is, is dying. Come, please, hurry, okay? And that's when the, the woman with the hemorrhage of 12 years showed up and all this stuff that happened that we just talked about. But then he gets, all of a sudden, uh, you know, get back to business to go see this little daughter of Jairus. Suddenly, somebody shows up from Jairus' house, okay, and says, uh, there's no need to bother the master anymore. Your daughter's dead. Sounds like the end of the story, doesn't it? What did Jesus say? Yes. Only believe. Only believe. And he gets to the little house, and of course, everybody's have what's called a a dirge or something, where you're, you know, uh, this sounds maybe crazy, but you know, when somebody dies, you can pay a big crowd to weep and wail and uh, that kind of stuff, and uh, you know, for, for somebody that's died or whatever, you know, and that's what was going on. Everybody was, you know crying and all that kind of stuff. And Jesus said, uh, she's not dead. She did to sleep. Now, did Jesus lie? No. What did he, what did he, he you know, what does faith do? Speaks of things that appear not as though they already are. He's not going to see what is. He's going to confess what can be through the promise of God. Does that make sense? So, yeah, see, the, the natural man looks only at the physical evidence here. She's dead, man. 
and they all were making fun of him and laughing and, you know, and boy, what a goofball this guy, you know. I mean, everybody knows he's dead. But see, we are not to walk by sight. Nope, 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 nope. Yeah, no, only by the promise of God. Does that make sense? So he takes the mother and the father and maybe some other family members. He kicks everybody out, but takes in Peter, James, and John. And then he goes in to where this little girl is, okay? Now, now why did he kick everybody else out? That's right. You don't, you don't want doubters in there. I, I promise you, there's a spirit of unbelief that comes out of people who have unbelief. Out of the abundance of the heart, what's that? The spirit and the mind or, you know, whatever. That's, that's what the heart is. Remember, what we, we talked about how all words have an anointing. I remember a situation where a pastor and his wife went into a house and they were going to minister to this family, but I guess just before they got there, there was some, you know, some angry words or something like that. And the second they walked in there, they said, sharp words, hate, whatever, had just been spoken in here because it affects the whole environment. Okay, so Jesus, you know, you, this is why, you know, don't share your pearls before swine. Remember that? But, you know, if you're going to pray a prayer of agreement, you've got to make sure somebody agrees. Now, most believers are unbelievers. I'm just going to tell you that, okay? That's just the reality, okay? Uh, and so uh, we have to find somebody that doesn't waffle or whatever, you know, and pr to pray a prayer of agreement. Okay, does that make sense? So uh, Jesus, of course, had selected out of the 12 disciples. He went, went in the mountain tran Mount of Transfiguration. He took three of the disciples. Who were they? Peter, James, and John. Same guys now. Now he's in there with Peter, James, and John. Okay, God always has a subset, in a sense, okay, uh, of, of out of the body. There are subsets of greater spiritual growth. And they have to do with this concept of 30, 60, and 100 fold. Okay, and some people mature, ripen, or something faster than others. Okay, does that make sense? But he's training these guys. He's teaching them. Okay, and so uh, what does Jesus do? The girl's not dead. She, you know, but he. It's very interesting. He speaks to the child and says, "Talitha kumi." Hmm, what's this thing called? Talith. Well, that's interesting. Talitha kumi. You know what this is? This is a play on words. Jesus was wearing his talit. And just like Elijah, you know, Elisha, okay? There are various situations. They'd take their talit and lay it. You know, one time Elijah laid down on a little boy, remember? Wearing his talit, had his seat seat, you know? Kid comes to life, you know? And so he... Speaks. Talitha kumi, which, like I said, is a play on words. Child of my talit. Arise. Arise. Okay? And immediately, the girl comes to life, you know, and I guess everybody thinks she's a ghost. So get her something to eat, you know. Ghosts don't eat, you know, whatever. But now who would have thought that that statement, you know, Talit the Kumi is talking about this. These are such little hidden meanings and things like this are all over in Scripture. They're all over in Scripture. Uh, but we have to kind of stay tuned in to, to, to get it, Okay. And, and uh, in your handout, you'll see all, you know, Mark chapter 6. Whenever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And every single one, as many as touched him, were healed. 
See, word got around. That woman with the hemorrhage of 12 years, she said, hey, you remember that prophecy in Malachi? When the son of righteousness comes, he'll come with healing in his wings. Well, guess what happened to me? You know? And uh, so this, I mean, who knows, maybe that hundreds, thousands, I don't know, people were healed just by touching, just by touching him. You know? Uh, but uh, again, this is, represents the power the power of the presence of God, okay? And the Word of God. Does that make sense? Okay? I'm down to two minutes. I better probably have to quit. All right? You learn anything today? Okay? Now, there's much, much, much more, okay, uh, covering this topic, okay? And so I'm going to uh, close with a prayer. All right, let's bow our hearts and our heads. Father God, I just thank you for the word of God. It's alive. It is, oh Lord, I just ask you to, by the spirit of God, open our eyes to see, ears to hear, and our minds to perceive and understand all of the wonderful things hidden in this word that are only visible by the enlightenment, the revelation of the word of God. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. All scripture is prophetic, and it all points to Christ. But Father, we must have the Holy Spirit to see. Now, what is another to lead? When Jesus comes back, he comes back with a garment dipped in blood. Now, what is that? At he's a to lead. He's got a to lead on when he comes back on his white horse. Okay? In, in Psalms, it says that he's wrapped in a garment of light. What is that? The Talit. All right? So, Father God, just open our eyes to see. Father, fill us with your power and wisdom and understanding, Father, that we can walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen.